I'm Jeff Korchek, and I'm proud to be joined by two colleagues today for our symposium presentation for the COA annual meeting on tools to stay on top of orthopedic knowledge. Uh, I'll be joined by Drs. Derek Moore and Drs. David Martin. So again, today's talk will be on, again, tools to stay on top of orthopedic knowledge. Um, Dr. Moore, or excuse me, Dr. Moore will be talking about the present and future of orthopedic education, uh, specifically in regards to orthopedic uh, bullets. Uh, Dr. Martin will be addressing his discussion to the ABOS examinations and certification with emphasis on the WLA. And I will be talking about the value of web-based sources, uh, view Medi, et cetera. Um, let me just say a couple things. When, all of us here today, I know Dr. Uh, Martin and I, I think Dr. Moore looks a lot younger than myself and Dr. Martin. Uh, I have to remember back to my early days in training when I think our primary sources for literature were the uh, Bone and Joint uh, Surgery uh, Journal and cl uh, Clinical Orthopedics and Related Research. In addition, a lot of our surgical uh, information we got out of uh, Campbell's Orthopedics, which we all eventually owned a copy of, and Rockwood and Green for fractures uh, treatment for both adults and children. But with time, things got very complicated and we have a slurry of various journals and other reference sources that now we're get, I think we get barraged from. And the question is, where do we go from this point, especially the practicing orthopedists, and I have to say for myself, the aging orthopedists, uh, because it's hard to keep up with all the research and journal articles. So again, I wanna pass this on now to talk to Dr. Moore, who will be talking about the present and future of orthopedic education, specifically in regards to orthopedic bullets. For those of you who don't know Dr. Moore, he's an orthopedic surgeon and founder and president of Orthopedic Bullets, um, which happens to be one of the most popular educational resources on musculoskeletal disease for physicians and patients. Um, it is a physician controlled organization and it provides tools for physicians that help them take better care of patients. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn over the symposium now to Dr. Moore. Okay, thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. Um, let's just make sure everybody can see my slide. You guys see my slides okay? Thumbs up? Okay, good. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. You know. I, I love the opportunity to speak about orthoped orthopedic education. It's really been kind of the, the main theme in my life or at least the last what seems to be 10, 20 years of my life. Um, so just quickly introduce myself. I'm uh, Derek Moore, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. I practice in Santa Barbara, California, but I also have started a company. I started when I was actually a resident, an orthopedic resident, and I've kind of grown it ever since. So right now I currently pretty much split my practice in some way, shape or form between the company and uh, my clinical practice as a spine surgeon. So what does that mean? That means that I am heavily conflicted in this talk. I own 50% of the shares in that company. And so when you hear me speak, you should really take it for a grain of salt. You can pretty much think of it as almost an industry talk just because that company is so influenced it. Now, I will say that the reason I started that company was I was a little bit unusual. I went to medical school at Stanford. I was there for the whole dot-com thing. And then after medical school, I went and worked at a company called Boston Consulting Group. Um, it's one of the more desirable companies to work for. And I worked there for a few years and it was an incredible few years. And then I had that unique experience of going from there back to residency. And it was really the differences on how I was treated at that company versus how I was treated during my residency in the next five years of my life, that really was the motivation for me to start OrthoBullets. You know, I really felt like there was opportunities for improvement and need for change by looking at those two situations side by side. So when I talk about, you know, I was tasked to talk about the future, past and present, or present and future of orthopedic education. Uh, one thing, let's not focus on the past. There's really no value there. The past is valuable to learn from, but I think it's always funner to think about the future and how we can make things better. So when I think about the future of orthopedic education, there's two things that I would just love to see. 
you know, after all these years. The first one is for us to truly embrace technology and innovation. And we talk about embracing technology, but if you look at the rate of change in our orthopedic educational community compared to the outside world, whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Goldman Sachs, we are nowhere near adopting new technologies as the rest of the world. And we really have to ask ourselves, why is the rate of change so slowed in our profession? We talk about it, we seem to want it, we have the goals of it, but we just can't get this stuff up and going. And whenever you have a situation like that, you really gotta stand back and say, hey, what's going on here? Why, why are we different than all these other best practices out there? So that's the first thing I wanna talk about. Now, one thing I learned at Boston Consulting Group is whenever you're trying to make change and it's hard, you gotta stand back and a lot of times the reason for the change not occurring is in these really abstract things, these cultural things, these biases, these things that grow in an organization for a long period of time. You know, the first thing they taught me at Boston Consulting Group, they said, the longer you think of a problem, the less likely you will be the person to fix it. You know, if you watch Steve Jobs, he talks about these forgot in this series called The Forgotten Interviews, he talks about these big digital companies like digital that all went belly up. And he said, the reason that they didn't succeed is that they basically weeded out their ability to change and innovate. And whenever that happens, you need to think about what are the cultural implications. And while we overlook it, I think, you know, all the technology, Orthobolus, Vumedi, all those things, yes, they're great new technologies, but before us, there was wheelless, other things. More important than anything else, in my opinion, is looking at the culture of how we train residents, the culture of how we treat them, the culture of how we pay them, the culture of how we appreciate educators. And in my opinion, that is the area where if we make change there, that's when we're gonna see really wonderful and exciting things happen in orthopedic education. So going into the first part of it, talking about embrace technology and innovation. So. I kind of went through just a, a checklist of things that I think are important over here on the left. So the things I'm gonna talk about are assessment tools. And I intensely talked about that because we have the honor of having Dr. Martin here and talking about the ABOS. And this is what they think about you know, all the time. This is their mission and passion. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about stuff that I do a lot with, which is learning technology and then the data science. So first let's talk about the assessment. So the reason I wanna talk about assessment is that assessment drives everything we do in education and learning. If you don't have the Olympics, nobody's going to wake up and practice on the ice at four o'clock in the morning for four years in a row. If you don't have the Super Bowl, the NFL is going to look very different. So in my opinion, the single most important thing about assessment is it creates the drive, the motivation, the want to learn, the drive, the motivation, motivation for our educators to teach. And that is why assessment, it really is the North Star that drives all things in education. That's a wonderful thing and a dangerous thing, because if it's driving everything, we really need to think about what that assessment is. So if we look at our assessment, look at, okay, here I am a spine surgeon in Santa Barbara, California. I look at how I got here today. These are the big things. MCAT, US and Lee step one, two, and three. And then it started being the OIT. And then ABUS part one, ABUS part two. And then I just recently took my I'm board certified for another 10 years, took my spine MOC before that I took WLA for two years. Those are the gateways that drove me to study, drove me to wake up in the morning and got me to where I am. But if you think about that, we got to think carefully about it because if it's driving behavior, we got to think about what behavior it's driving. So looking at this data on the right, I show data like this all the time. And I, I just, this is orthobolus data. I don't have you know, it's the best data set I have. This is looking at how much residents study from one program. You know, it basically looks like all the programs. Down on the bottom is the months. The green is the number of practice questions they do. The yellow is the number of journal articles they read. And what do you see here? You see these big spikes, October, July. Why do we have those spikes? ABS part one in July. Spike in OIT, OIT. And I tell people, I'm like, if this was a professional violinist, would this be what it looks like? Would they practice three months out of the year? If you wanted good, healthy teeth, would you brush your teeth three months out of the year? 
Yet this is the behavior we have in how our residents learn. Somebody posted on Twitter the other day, they're like, ah, oh, you know, because of orthobolus, residents don't read textbooks anymore. They don't read journal articles. Before orthobolus, it was wheelless online. We're overlooking the problem. The reason residents aren't doing the things we want them to do is we're only incentivizing them and rewarding them for good OIT scores. If you're in a program and you have 95% OIT scores, you walk around the program, you know, like a hero, where if you have low OIT scores, it's the inverse. So, you know, I have kids, I'm locked up in this closet here because my kids are downstairs and life comes down to incentive and reward. And with our current assessment tools, we have to ask ourselves, are we rewarding the proper behavior? Now, here's another great example of it. This was one of the great successes, music to my ears in the last 10 years of medical education. They finally put a bullet in US only step one. They finally converted it to pass, no pass. So let's look at what the emphasis on US only step one. This is a graph looking at average pass rates. You know, every year data goes to the core meeting. Every year, all the residency programs say the same thing. Our OIT scores are going up and up and up. Our incoming residents, how can their scores just keep going up and up and up? For them to go up and up and up, we must be saying, wow, they must be doing something really good in medical school education. Those classes must be really good. They must have new technology, new things. Something special must be going on there. Where if you actually look at the data, the percentage of medical schools going to class has gradually declined over the last 10 years to now, this data is outdated. Less than 10% of medical schools go to class. That's a paradox that we have to be very concerned about. How can the scores go up, yet nobody goes to class? And the reason is because of a thing called Anki. It's a flashcard system, I'll talk more about it. But basically, residents knew or medical students knew that if they wanted to match in orthopedics, they needed rocket high USM leaf scores. To get rocket high USM leaf scores, all the data shows one thing. You don't go to a classroom. You study on a space repetition algorithm that has you know, somehow generated an algorithm that can you know, read what it takes to do well for the test. So we created, the USME literally created a system where medical students would not want to go to hear a Nobel laureate speak about their profession. And we just had to ask about what is that impact of assessment because it has this downstream effect. So that's the first thing. You know, the next thing I think about is, okay, if, if formal assessment drives all behavior, it is the holy grail that's going to drive this behavior for years, what should that formal assessment look like? This is a case, this is, you know, a case posted on Orthobolus. There's cases like this on ViewMedi. There's cases like this on YouTube. There's nothing real important about this case. I'm just bringing it up. I do spine, but you can see here you have a femoral neck fracture, 76-year-old female. If you ask people on what they would do, this is a poll on how they treat it. So 99% of people would choose operative treatment. I say, here's an example. You don't need, even need to teach this to the resident. You have so much consensus around this that it's not something we need to talk about. But then let's ask the question, okay, would you do a total hip or a hemiarthroplasty? And the data gets more interesting. Now, 44% would do a hemiarthroplasty, 51% would be a total hip. I tell residents, this is what's gonna keep you distracted when your kids are speaking to you at dinner at night, your first five years on practice when you're taking call. This is the essence of medicine. This is the essence of why our job can be stressful and come home with us. And this is just one example. Look at this example. Okay, when would you do the surgery? I have this conversation all the time going to the front desk. Oh, I got to add on a case. Is it emergent? Well, it's kind of emergent. It's more like urgent. How much, you know, the point being is that I don't know exactly when I have to take this patient to surgery, but these are the decisions that characterize my career, my profession. Yet, these questions don't look anything like anything I ever took on the spine MOC exam last year or OIT before. So my thing is we now have so much data out there. We have the EMR data. We have all this social network data. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity when our assessment tools really reflect that challenge that we have, that clinical challenge that we have in practice. And I'll be honest, I took the MOC David, I took the spine practice profile exam, and that was a, 
when I was taking that exam, I walked out of there and I was like, oh my God, that really felt like a day in clinic. You know, most of it was the same stuff. It was the clinical decisions I was making in very ways, in many ways that exam did or was aligned with what my practice was. And it just goes to show that if your assessment is aligned with what you do, then people are going to repair. So, so that's my point on that. So the next thing I want to move on to in terms of assessment is this concept of prevention. So when I talk about modern analytics, I say that the air of modern analytics, why everybody's talking about analytics is finally we have enough data to prevent adverse outcomes. So I tell people if a resident, you know, fails on ABOS part one, what the hell happened? We have his OIT scores. Why didn't we know that before he walked in there? we should be able to easily test them in advance to prevent that adverse outcome. So how does that work? If you look at this graph on the right, I don't know if any of you guys know what this is. So this is a Dexcom monitor from a type one diabetic patient. So if you look on the left, that's a glucose of 216. That's a high glucose. That's a bad outcome. You never wanna look at a Dexcom and see that. But if you look on the right, it's 84. But why is the 84 red and pointing down? The reason is because, well, first of all, for I'm sure most of you guys know this, but 84 is like the perfect glucose level. You know, if my son's glucose is 84, it's perfect and I'm happy. But look below it, it's got two stars going down. So the red flag is because it's warning me that I'm heading in a direction and I need to correct before I get down to 52. That's what a modern GPS does. When was the last time? Jeff, you got lost. David, when's the last time you got lost driving? Your GPS won't let you get lost. It starts beeping and saying, you're making a long turn. You're making a long turn. Go left, go left, go left. We now have enough data in orthopedic education to prevent any adverse outcome. Nobody has to fail ABOS part one. Nobody has to add poor OIT scores. And once we have that, once we accept the fact that you have 100% pass rate, that's a beautiful thing, in my opinion. I'm not saying it's easy, it would take a long way to get there, but in my opinion, if we have assessment where it's so frequent, you prevent this adverse outcome, that's a great thing. You know, imagine testing a pilot for impairment every five years and you find out that he's a drinker. Like, what does that mean? What has he been doing for the last six months? You know, it's too late if you detect that adverse outcome. So that's, you know, my feelings on that. And I think we're getting there and that's modern analytics and there's a lot of change happening, but I think that's really the exciting opportunity. Now, the last thing in terms of assessment is scope. And, you know, this is a very controversial area. And what we know is this, is that when we had the general MOC and people had to study general orthopedics, they learned general orthopedics. It was very controversial. And I know for myself, if, when I had to take my exam, if I had to study something about ankle, it was, I would have been very frustrated. And the practice profile exam is a, it was a very doable, manageable test and I liked it. But the question is, if you really dive into why doctors were upset about general MOC, it wasn't because they didn't like having all that knowledge. You know, knowing about all these other things is important as a spine surgeon and we're becoming highly specialized. The reason they were unhappy in my opinion is they forgot it and then they had to learn it again. So they were upset because they didn't have the time and effort to relearn all this general orthopedics that they had forgotten. Where if you actually implement these new technologies, I think we can do something better and actually prevent them forgetting it. So in modern learning with these new technologies, I think that should be the goal. I'm not saying I'm gonna be doing, you know, ankle operations, you know, I'm happy with doing five to 10 spine procedures. That's my comfort zone. I, I enjoy doing those procedures. I can always do them better. But in terms of medical knowledge, keeping your knowledge base broader, I think there are benefits to that. So let's move on to the next component of this learning technology. So, so technology is obviously something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, I spend a lot of time learning about these new technologies. This is one thing I can say for sure is that because of COVID, there's been a gigantic shift towards virtual education. And if you look at the amount of venture capital money that's gone into digital education in the last year, 
it's a huge increase from where we were. So more money, resources gone into medical education technology in the last year than probably the last 10 years combined. And that's really exciting because it's driving technology, new algorithms, technology companies, the rate of change is fast. So fast that I find it scary because you know someday somebody might disrupt us as a company. If you look at the real themes in those new technologies, these are the themes that really come across. One is this concept of precision. So here, precision, you know, when you do a total knee or say I'm doing a pedicle screw. So I use navigation when I do my posterior cervicals. There's no way in the world I could put a pedicle screw in the C7 pedicle as precisely with a freehand technique than if I use navigation. That's precision. So what it means is that it's a very good fit for the learner. So when you talk about education, it's the concept that every learner is different. So Jeff has a, a learning need at this moment in time that's different than David. So in the ideal learning situation, we would teach Jeff a different le le uh, lesson than we would teach David. Now, that is the real opportunity. Now, if you look here, the big problem or the, the advantage of precision learning is that it improves this inefficiency in education. So when we think about learning and what we're doing now, we're actually doing a pretty good job learning. The problem is we've just overlooked this other problem for a long time in that we forget everything. So it's not that we're doing a bad job learning, we're just doing a bad job reinforcement. We did a great job getting orthopedic residents to pass ABOS part one. We just didn't give them any incentive or technology to keep that information in their brain. So they all literally forgot it all within 12 months. That's a lot of value wasted, spending five years killing yourself for an exam and forgetting in this study, 50% of it, 12 months later, that's like taking half my salary that I make in 12 months and throwing it out the window at the end of the year. Like, why would we do that? Why would we lose that? So in order to prevent that loss of memory, we need to implement these new space repetition algorithms. Now, to do that, when we talk about education, I always tell people we need to think of education in terms of value. So value is, we all know the value equation, it's quality over cost. In the world of education, I tell people quality is what is the retention? How long do you learn that stuff for? The cost is how much time did you put into it and how much money did you pay? And you always, whenever you think of an educational effort, whether it's a conference with residents, whether it's a you know, uh, educational activity like this, you just have to look at what is the quality? How much are people learning? How long do they remember it? And what was the cost for it? So when we think of that, these are the things that I think are important. Now this, Jeff, this goes back to what you talked about. It was very easy back then. There was JBGS, you know, these different textbooks, that's what everybody learned from. This is looking at what medical students learn from now. This is Google medical websites, textbooks. So you can see the textbooks are so low. Now, if you look at what that's being replaced by, this is the drive in podcast, massive growth in podcast. It's basically replaced the textbooks. This is an even more alarming new technology. This isn't the podcast, this is Alexa. So this is drive of people asking Alexa flashcards. You know, what's the mechanism of this injury? What's the mechanism of this enzyme? So that is an alarming growth in new technology. So the question is, why are those technologies so powerful? And D Jeff, to go back, I tell people, people used to read textbooks. Then they read, then they read orthobolus topics, or then they read JBGS review articles, Yellow Journal review articles. And then they got smaller and they went to orthobolus review topics. Then they went smaller and they went to orthobolus or SAE questions. Now they want even smaller, they want flashcards. So the biggest disruptive thing that's happened in medical education is this thing called Anki. And we all, David, I bet you can remember your organic chemistry flashcards. Jeff, you had your organic chemistry flashcards. The flashcard hasn't changed, but now the thing is the flashcard has become personalized, is tied to a space repetition algorithm. And that's where you have this incremental value. And that's why USMLE scores are going up so rapidly. So 
this goes back to that thing. So less than 10% of medical students go to class. Look at this scatter plot. This is a study looking at the correlation between going to medical school class and your final exam. No correlation. The reason classrooms don't work is it's one size fits all. We don't use one, you know, three, five plate for every distal radius fracture. It's, you need to customize, you need to be precise. Every learner has different needs. So classrooms have just kind of gone by the wayside. So how do we replace that in medical education? The funny thing here is, do you know what we do? We go back to how they did it 50 years ago. You do it at the bedside. So whenever I do this thing with residents, I do this game and it, it's kind of the biggest thing. I ask a resident, I'm like, when was the last time you were in the emergency room seeing a pediatrics fracture? And they're like, oh, I, I, this is all hypothetical. They'll be like, oh, I saw one yesterday in the emergency room. I'm like, I don't want to hear about yesterday. Tell me about one last month. And he's like, well, okay. All right. Yeah, I was down at you know this hospital. And it'd be like, well, I can't remember. It's a month ago. I can't remember what I saw. I'm like, no, think about it. Go back to a fracture in the emergency room. And they think for a while, they struggle. And finally, they, they clatch on to a case. And I say, okay, what was it? And they'll be like, you know, a lateral conduct fracture, you know, and I'll be like, how old was the patient? That'd be 16. I'll say, well, where were you? And they look at me like, oh, oh. and then like, oh yeah, ER Bay 12. And then I'll be like, well, who was in the room with you? And they're like, ah, the kid's mom. And I say, well, what color shirt was she wearing? And he's like, whoa, she was wearing a red shirt. And I say, well, what JBGS article did you read within five minutes of seeing that patient? And they say, uh, I didn't. And I'm like, well, if you had read a JBGS article on lateral conduct fractures within five minutes, five seconds of seeing that patient, you'd remember it for the rest of your career. Yet instead we're teaching people stuff in classrooms where the retention is so low. You know, the value of the educational effort is so low. So, you know, I think that are the key concept, this concept that you always learn in the patient in front of you. You're always doing these small learning activities and it's all personalized. So how can we do that? You know, there's no way a human team can do that. You know, there's, you know, how many residents in the world? Every one of them is different. So you can see here that that is where these algorithms come into learning. And if anybody hasn't heard of SM2 or HLR, you know, those that's like saying I've never heard of Rockwood and Green in modern education. You know, these algorithms are so profound, so powerful, they are gonna dictate this. I tell people that you can drive your car into a gas station, pump a gas into your car, your car is gonna go 10 times faster and it's gonna cost 10 times less. That's what these algorithms have the potential to do. They're that powerful. And we're seeing it in our USM Lee scores. So that is, in my opinion, the key to these algorithms is these, you know, this personalization, that precision, and that bedside learning. Now, one of the algorithms I talked about is machine learning. So people kind of question, what is machine learning? This is a, a good example of machine learning. This is at John Hopkins University where they use machine learning to improve the diagnosis of sepsis. And what they found by using machine learning is they basically can diagnose sepsis 24 hours before a physician can, and they can basically keep people from going into organ, organ dysfunction much sooner than a physician by looking at this. So, so what are the key components of machine learning? It's when you take one individual, let's say a learner, let's say resident B, who is preparing for ABOS part one, and you compare him to all the residents that took ABS part one last year and their outcome score. And you look at everything they did. Did they read JBGS? Did they read JBGS before or after yellow journal articles? And you create correlations on what they did. And then you turn that back into an improved pathway for that resident. And it's basically learning, using or leveraging the mistakes of others, the, the successes of others and passing those on to the next person. And it can be, you know, very powerful. So I think machine learning, it's got a few years before it comes to orthopedics, but I think it, once it does, it's going to be powerful. Um, so going on to the last slide. So this is pretty much wrapping it up. I think we're a little bit over. So everything I talked about was really about data, about these algorithms. Now, 
the power of an algorithm is only as good as the size of the database. Now, when I talk about educational databases, sometimes people look at me a little bit funny. They're, they are no different than a registry. So if you think of, okay, why don't we have great registries in the United States? You know, why does Scandinavia have the best registries? They have a key component of it, which is that they have, you know, greater than a certain percentage. They, they have the majority of the people in the registry. I tell people, think of the NFL combine. Imagine if only 40% of all the quarterback prospects went to the NFL combine. It wouldn't be valuable because the value of the combine is benchmarking everybody on the same metrics. And in order to do that in education, to really get good at it, and there's been a lot of progress, we need to come up with those standardized outcome measure tools. We got to come up with those educational registries. And most of all, or not most of all, but also important is we need to identify the biases that are affecting our decisions in education. And whenever we talk about randomized clinical trials, whenever we talk about clinical outcomes, whenever a doctor stands up and talks about clavicle fractures, they disclose their biases. And there's still a lot of bias in what drives our decisions in education. And the only way to you know, understand bias is, is data. So I think getting that data, you know, those, excuse me, registries are gonna be really important in education. Um, so this is uh, my last slide. So all the stuff I talked about was about kind of the fun stuff, the technology, the change, the assessment. But I do think that the most important thing that's gonna drive that stuff is really this change in human resource reform, HR reform in education. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this. It's just a thought. I just wanna put it out there because I do think that when we look at education five years from now, I think this is where we're gonna see a lot of change that is much more important than some new algorithm. And that's really how we incentivize to drive that best education in our training program. And you know, the things that just kind of come to mind is, you know, we pay, they, there are gifted faculty. You know, we struggle to get residents to be really good at surgery coming out of training. And there are gifted faculty that spend years teaching residents how to do an operation in a shorter period of time. They're gifted at it. And there's other faculty that just don't really do it at all. Yet, oftentimes they are kind of on the same educational track or their same incentive track. So, you know, I think once we truly reward and incentivize those great educators, you know, I think education is really going to see a lot of improvement. I think the same thing's true for residents. Whether you're a great resident or a not so good resident, you both kind of graduate the same after five years. You know, that's not how it works at Goldman Sachs. That's not how it works at McKinsey. That's not how it works at Google. And you're not doing anybody a favor by keeping them on this flat career development curve. You know, you want to drive people. You want people to be the best they can be. And you have to create a, a culture, incentive structures within that department, within that organization to drive that. And we really just don't think of residents as this incredible talent pool that if we incentivize properly, can make the department tons of money and take better care of patients and do operations. And I think once we treat them as that, like Google treats their employees, we're going to see that they're going to generate much more value for society. And then last thing that I really, you know, think is important is this concept of fit. It, you know, 25% of all orthopedic surgeons leave their first job. Why we think a resident is going to be able to choose his residency and be there for five years, at least all of them, I think it's tough. So, you know, you know, there's people thinking about this, the way we can better match fit in residence, make sure residents are happier in residency, make sure it's a good fit. If they're not a good fit, we got to create some type of exchange. You know, in Switzerland, residents change hospitals all the time. If they're not being treated well, they go and do their residency at another hospital. The hospitals are competing for the best residents. So it creates that market dynamic where people simply are treated better. And we don't have that in orthopedic education. Residents are basically locked in for five years. And if we create some type of exchange where residents can switch programs easily, not that everybody would, but in that rare situation, then I think we can get our wellness factor up, our fit factor up, and you know, be more productive and generate more value with these residents and training. So, so with that, I'm going to hand it over.
Okay. Uh, I got to tell you, David, if you weren't taken back, I have to say I was taken back, Derek, with uh, all this updated data information because, uh, again, I don't believe I surely didn't have that exposure. And I know David probably were cohorts. We didn't have that type of exposure through our training, but it's, it's just fascinating information. I think the academy and the board has to probably, it probably is looking at the, all these factors. So hopefully we'll have some discussion on that at the end. Uh, so now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin, for those of you who don't know him, um, I have had the pleasure of knowing him through the board and meeting him at various academy meetings. He's currently the executive medical director of the a American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. He's been the past president of the ABOS. He's an active member of residency review in the past. Um, he has quite a, a extensive CV going back to his training. He's still active in research and in active practice. He's still active in sports medicine and with uh, Wake Forest. Um, and again, the good thing I, I'm happy to know is that being that he's on the board, he doesn't get a free pass and he's still participating in uh, maintenance of certification. So I'm glad to know that he's doing it. I'm on my fourth, fourth pass through this. So again, I'd like to turn things out over to uh, Dr. Martin. Great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, talk with you all and uh, hopefully uh, you can see my slides. Uh, and I'm going to try and talk about orthopedic knowledge assessments and the challenge of uh, making those uh, an educational process. And uh, I don't have any financial conflicts. As you heard, I, I was a member of the ABOS Board of Directors from 25 to 2015. I've been the Executive Medical Director over the last five and a half years, and I still practice uh, orthopedic surgery and sports medicine at Wake Forest one day a week. So I'm passionate about these subjects and I believe in them. Uh, so I'm conflicted in that way, but I don't have any financial conflicts. So I'd like to start out with a little cartoon uh, and I hope this will uh, touch on Dr. Moore's talk a little bit as well. And it, it speaks to sports medicine. So uh, this is Snoop Beers, a team doctor trotting out onto the field to aid a distressed player. And you see, uh, you know, hmm, takes a good history, looks the patient over and makes a diagnosis. Obviously, simple case of hyponatremia. Very common in our athletes. He runs, gets water, uh, comes back and says, you know, a great treatment plan, all he needs is a little water and a little salt. And you might say at that point, wow, that's a great answer. You're ready for board certification, ready to roll on. And what I would say is not so fast. Uh, if I show you the last panel and show you the actual treatment plan, you might say, wait a minute, that physician is not actually ready to be board certified. And what I wanna try and convince you is that board certification is more than just a test. Certainly the knowledge is important, but it's more than just a test. And so by way of overview, uh, I just wanna give you a little brief introduction to the ABOS, where we came from and who we are. I'll also talk about maintenance of certification and how we're working to make that innovative, valuable, and also relevant to physicians across their careers. And then we'll spend uh, the bulk of our time on our knowledge assessment pathways and how we're trying to utilize those to advance orthopedic knowledge. And that'll be our oral recertification examination, our practice profile computer-based recertification examinations, and then finally, our longitudinal assessment program. And we like to think that they stimulate lifelong learning. Uh, certainly, if you look at the figures here, learning never ends, but our challenge is that we have to assess orthopedic surgeons over the course of their career and also try and utilize that to push their education over the course of their career. And when we look at orthopedic surgeons, we look at all ages, we look at all types of practice, we have 29,000 diplomates. And so to try and apply programs to that number of people uh, is the challenge. So just by way of history, the AMA was around in the middle 1800s. At the turn of the century, our parent organization, the American Orthopedic Association, was a leadership organization. That was the upper crust of orthopedic surgery. And at the turn of the century, they said, you know, we need a group that everyone can be a member of. And they formed the academy 
1933 to be an education and advocacy organization that all could be a member of. And then they said, we need another organization to look at board certification. And in their wisdom formed a separate and independent organization in 1934. And that was the board. Since that time, uh, our composition has changed somewhat, although not our founding organizations. We have a national board of directors, 21 members, 20 orthopedic surgeons and a public member. And they're nominated by three organizations, the AAOS, the AOA and the AMA. And that forms our board. They set our direction and set our policies and our course. We then have a staff of 13 that's full-time in Chapel Hill. We've uh, not been in Chapel Hill over the past year, uh, only sporadically. We are working remotely at this point. But our chief operating officer is Aaron White. I'm the executive medical director. And then we have 11 staff members in various areas. And we utilize various uh, outside resources to handle all of our programs. I show you our board of directors. This is our board of directors at our virtual meeting uh, last October. And uh, number one, to let you know that they're a dedicated group of people to trying to get this right. We would like to get board certification and assessment of orthopedic surgeons right so that it's not only valuable, but relevant and also uh, does the right things. I also show you this to let you know that we're all practicing orthopedic surgeons and we go through the same processes as Dr. Korchak alluded to, as you do. These are the initial certification dates and then the recertification dates for each of our directors and several have subspecialty certification in either orthopedic sports medicine or surgery of the hand. So let's talk about maintenance of certification. We like to think that maintenance of certification is set up to try and reflect critical core physician values, compassion, patient-centered, passion for education, and that this is a peer-developed system developed by orthopedic surgeons for orthopedic surgeons to try and encourage continuous professional development across their career. We would like to assist diplomates efforts as they try and stay up to date and never stop learning, which we feel is critically important. Now, I do get a lot of pushback on MOC and I would like to say it's not just an exam. People say it's onerous, it's hard to understand. This is the whole MOC program, ABOS MOC in one slide, and I can explain, explain it in less than a minute. We look at professional standing, that's unrestricted licensure, that's hospital or surgery center privileges that are clear. We look at continuing medical education, 240 CME of which 40 need to be self-assessment over a 10 year cycle. That's actually just slightly less than California requires to, be, uh, to maintain your license. And then we look at a knowledge assessment during that 10 year cycle. And this is where we'll focus. We need a successful completion of either an oral exam, a computer-based examination, or a web-based longitudinal assessment. And finally, we look at practice improvement. And we do that by doing a peer review process and obtaining a case list from each diplomat during their 10 year cycle. And I feel like this is a pretty good look at an orthopedic surgeon. We want them to have good professional standing. We want them to be keeping up with their CME. We'd like to have some kind of knowledge assessment because truly you do need some basic knowledge to be competent and we'll talk about that. And then to look at what their peers think of them and to look at a sample of their cases and have them look at a sample of their cases. So that's the whole program. Now I'd like to focus on those knowledge assessments. And first the oral recertification examination. This is a uh, one pathway that our diplomates could choose. It's administered in Chicago each July. Uh, that's been modified again over the past two years, but it's generally a two hour exam over four 25 minute periods, two examiners in each of those periods. Our diplomates submit a case list to the ABOS with their application. We have case selectors choose 12 of their own cases, and then they submit documentation images and documents from the patient's history, and they're examined based on a, a standard scoring rubric on those particular cases, on their own practice. So this is for a subspecialized practice, someone who would like to be examined on their very own practice. Obviously, we've made multiple modifications to that over the last two years. Uh, some of those have helped us improve. As um, Dr. Moore said, we've learned a whole lot more about uh, education and uh, technology and processes over the last year and a half than we had in probably the previous 10. 
We think this though is a really good examination. If you look at the green box, you know, a lack of knowledge certainly means you're incompetent. If you don't have knowledge, you probably can't be competent. But just because you have knowledge, that doesn't always equal competence. And the critical measure is the application of that knowledge. And I was really happy that Dr. Moore said he felt like his spine exam was a day uh, seeing patients because that's the goal to try and apply the knowledge. But we think this really get, gives us a chance to look at not only knowledge, but decision making and patient care that you don't see on just a written examination. And we use a standard scoring rubric, it's pictured here, but you, you can download that on our website uh, to see how we evaluate cases. That's the oral examination. We feel like looking at your cases, the case list causes you to look back over 75 cases, but we feel like an examination to really look critically at a set of your own cases is valuable. The computer-based examinations, and um, I'm sure Dr. Korczak remembers the picture on the left, that's the basement of the Hyatt, where we all took the part one examination uh, with books like you see on the bottom. I'm not sure Dr. Moore is that old, he may be. Okay, yeah, so now we're actually in uh, Prometric centers and uh, you'll see even on the bottom right, they have the mood lighting. I've not found that in the Prometric testing centers and they are secure and there is some uh, um, negative aspects of visiting those, but they certainly uh, do a good job of standardizing the examination. We've tried to meet diplomates at their practice. These practice profiled examinations are only questions from that particular uh, uh, subspecialty. It's a three hour examination, 150 multiple choice questions in three 60 minute sessions administered in Prometric testing centers uh, between August and October. What I would uh, point you to is the blueprints that are available on our website. These are blueprints that can really help uh, in the educational process to learn. This is what's included on the examination, but moreover, it's a group of orthopedic experts from those subspecialties that helped us put together what's important for a practicing orthopedic surgeon to know in these subspecialty areas. So those are available on our website. This is the cover of one. They're each about uh, 10 to 20 pages and uh, really are a, a, a good uh, uh, system to look at your study. These are the areas that we offer. Again, uh, the nine subspecialties, we're happy to offer orthopedic oncology this year. But I would also uh, tell you, and I know that, uh, again, we talked about the knowledge, but this is a study that has come out actually this month um, from the American Board of Internal Medicine. And it's a little bit uh, difficult to get into, but they looked at scores on their recertification multiple choice examinations, and they looked at outcomes for um, visits that were at heightened risk for diagnostic errors. And they actually found that if you scored higher on their multiple choice examination, you had a lower risk of adverse outcomes with patients that you saw. So it's interesting data that says maybe preparing for a multiple choice examination and having that knowledge does help. And that's a, something that we'll have to look at uh, with some of the methods that uh, Dr. Moore talked about, because those have become uh, very powerful. And finally, I'll spend a little bit more time on our web-based longitudinal assessment. A point in time exam is there is value to learning and certainly you have to have a knowledge base, but I think the ongoing learning is probably more important. We like to think about this and we're in the assessment business. We're not necessarily in the education business, but this is more of a formative assessment. You can customize the assessment, it's flexible. You, uh, our diplomates use their own computer on their own time. Um, it encourages continued learning because it's based on current orthopedic literature and provides immediate feedback uh, as people work through uh, this assessment. Basically, to just give you an overview, it, we post 200 knowledge sources, journal articles, guidelines, uh, appropriate utilization criteria. We do that in January. Our diplomates can select 15 of those for in-depth study. And then in April and May, we open the window uh, and they answer 30 multiple choice questions, two from each of the knowledge sources that they chose. And they get three minutes per question. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And they can answer as many or as few in each sitting. They just have to finish all of them by the deadline at the end of May. 
Successful completion is five quality years, so participating for five years, and that's 24 out of 30 questions correct in each of those years. This is what the um, platform looks like when you go there. This uh, diplomat uh, actually uh, has already chosen 15, but you see they're organized by category, uh, dull recon foot and ankle. If we, if we clicked on the foot and ankle, this is what that would look like. Th these are uh, whited out because they've already chosen 15. If you would remove the one selection they chose, they could choose one of these other ones. Before they even choose those, they can click on the actual title and get to uh, the actual source to decide which ones they'd like to review. On the dashboard are two things which we think are really important. It shows sort of on the right how they've done. This person's done very well over the last two years. Uh, they can review the question history or they can go to sample questions. The question history is real nice. So if they go back, here's questions that were answered back in May of 2020. Clicking on the question here would take them to actual question and how they answered. And then this gives the knowledge source uh, and hovering over that on the website would also uh, give you which knowledge source that came from. The sample questions uh, help people mo uh, motor through the system. But you see, you're about to begin a sample question. This is exactly how the actual platform works. You'll get one of two, question one of two from this knowledge source. If you want to click on that, you can review it. Uh, otherwise, if you hit start question, the question comes up. Uh, obviously, the timer starts to click down and click and submit your answer. If during that time period you like to click on uh, the link and look at the article, most people have those downloaded already by that time. That's how the system works. Um, in the first two years, in 2019, we had uh, just over 9,000 people participated. That was about 55% of the people who were eligible. 98% uh, earned a quality year. That was uh, just under 300,000 questions. And we looked at the three minutes and really most people answered the question in about a minute. When we uh, did a survey, you'll see in that pie chart that most people felt like it was uh, the overall experience was good, very good or excellent. We've really gotten great feedback. And I would tell you that in the second year last year, 12,000 people participated. And if you think about that, that's 12,000 people. That's nearly 200,000 articles that people actually read. And I think that, you know, some people call and say, oh, I read more than that. Well, some people don't know what to read. And this gives them an idea of what to read. Many people earned a quality year, but I think the, the real uh, value is uh, experience in the orthopedic literature. Uh, so just to look to the future briefly, we're looking at ways to improve, uh, just like uh, Dr. Moore talked about, leveraging technology. We try and target our communications. We want to collaborate with our stakeholders, the academies, uh, societies such as California Orthopedic Association. Uh, we're trying to be transparent and get feedback. Please contact uh, me with any feedback that you have. And we're certainly looking at diversity. If, if we do not want board certification or the ABOS to be the reason that orthopedics uh, does not become more diversified, both uh, with underrepresented minorities and uh, as far as gender goes. So that's an area we're looking at. We're looking at lifelong process. We want to reduce burden, increase the value. We're trying to serve our patients, our profession and the public. And we're really committed to this physician self-regulation. If we stepped out of this arena, somebody else would step into it. And we really feel like a dedicated group of orthopedic surgeons looking at this by orthopedic surgeons for orthopedic surgeons is the best way. Um, to cater to our younger audience, we are active on social media. Please look for us there. We do have this patient-facing website, My Certified Orthopedic Surgeon, which you can direct your patients to, and that will tell them what people go through to become board certified. And I really thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Please, if you have any feedback on our processes, don't hesitate to call us. Uh, we're listening. Thank you very much. Jeff, uh, mic on. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I was saying, for some reason, I don't see my uh, image on this screen, but uh, I can feel calm. I hope you're seeing it. Are you at this point? Yes. Yes, okay. we are.
All right. So I want to just continue on on more of what uh, I guess my experience in ongoing uh, orthopedic training and knowledge. Um, just a little bit of feedback on my own practice. Uh, as I mentioned, I might be one of the older people in the room here. I completed my residency training in 1987. And uh, my first board certification was in 1989. And I've continued on since then and are pleased to participate in WLA, which we can talk about at the end. So uh, for further purposes, um, okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about the value of web-based sources, specifically, I think, in the uh, clinical practice of uh, ongoing orthopedics, especially for, I think, our, our more mature, I would say, orthopedic surgeons that have been in practice the last 10 to 20 years, um, and what you can do to continue with knowledge uh, updates. So I'm going to focus on some of the sites that I have utilized, uh, that being ViewMedi, um, YouTube, and uh, Twitter, more so uh, for some of our uh, younger colleagues. Uh, first of all, what these web-based platforms, I'm looking at, at them, again, on more of a clinical uh, approach to practice, whereas uh, Dr. Moore or Derek was discussing some of the education that is being used in residency training. So I'm gonna focus more on the active orthopedist who is in practice on a daily basis and utilizing some of these platforms uh, for their own practice. So most of these are videos that for communication purposes that are involved with teaching and case discussions. Uh, they will generally share new ideas and techniques especially, and some will allow for physician feedback. Uh, some of the drawbacks, though, are obviously quality and accuracy of content, and uh, in some areas, data confidentiality. Now, I'm going to focus or, uh, mostly on ViewMedi, at least more emphasis, because I have to say, in my last uh, five or 10 years of practice, uh, myself and my colleagues, and especially my partner, uh, we, I use ViewMedi on a weekly basis uh, on certain cases that I might want to review that I may have not done in the last uh, you know, recent period. Uh, so for those of you who haven't experienced ViewMedi, um, first of all, it is one of the leading video sources for procedures and seminars and webinars out there. And people may not understand that it's also there for these seminars and webinars. The greatest benefit though, I think is the case or surgical preparation. And I think this is very helpful because again, for those of us who have been out of training for 10, 15 years, it's nice to have a source that you can go to and visually view a procedure uh, and, and get a lot of feedback. And there's a lot of uh, cases to review. Now, one thing is there is the lack of peer review uh, that these, I'll talk about how these videos are submitted and, but there is allow, it does allow, the site allows for viewer comments and response. You know, one interesting thing, I went to find out information uh, and most of the people with ViewMedi, this, this year, especially like everybody else are working on uh, remotely. Um, so the individual I spoke to is in charge of the orthopedic sector. She's actually uh, in Europe, um, but I got a lot of the history from ViewMedi talking to her and also going online. It was actually interestingly started in about 2008 by this gentleman, uh, Roman Guyverts. He was a graduate engineering student at Cal Berkeley. And his father-in-law was an orthopedic surgeon. And what stimulated him to to develop UMedi was his father-in-law was interested in getting some information on a shoulder surgical procedure. And that's what led to him getting into trying to develop a platform that would allow surgeons to have access to different procedures. Now the platform is free to licensed physicians and allied health, and they try to verify uh, your licensure of physicians getting access to the site. And it is funded by medical device companies and pharma. But I have to say that in my viewing of the, the sites, it doesn't even phase me. It's almost like the pop-up ads you might see when you're looking at something on the internet or, uh, so I don't think that it has a tremendous influence on some of the stuff that's uh, accepted or viewed. Uh, at least I haven't found it to be so. The content once again is submitted by physicians and it's reviewed, it is reviewed for inappropriate subject matter. So it's not like YouTube where something might go on uh, or Twitter, something might be posted and yet it's pulled down later. They, they review these uh, videos before they're put up on the site. 
But again, it's not peer review before it goes on the site other than for inappropriate content. And it does allow for, or they want to encourage doctors to comment. The submitted materials are, again are procedure videos, but the thing I found very helpful are a lot of the seminars and webinars and meetings. Again, if any of you are on ViewMedi, I'm sure you every day you get a ViewMedi uh, post on your email for something that comes up. And interestingly, during this last year of COVID, there have been a lot of relevant webinars dealing with COVID and our orthopedic practice, not just surgical procedures. Now, one thing uh, that's actually benefit, they don't provide CME credit. At one time, I think they did in the early years, but they don't do it any longer because they don't wanna compete with any of the provider content, especially the webinars and seminars that I'll talk about. Now here's, I just wanted to show you uh, or give you some information on their metrics and who they are. Interesting, this is probably some data collected up through 2020, uh, December. They have about 680,000 registered users. And of those users, 20% are orthopedic surgeons. And of the contributed videos, 40% of those videos are, again, orthopedic related videos. So there's quite a lot of content on ViewMedi that's specifically oriented towards orthopedists. Now, what's interesting, the orthopedic community, once again, uh, about 131,000 registered orthopedists worldwide and about 16,000 videos that are, have been posted for orthopedics. And they get a lot of contributors, as you see in the bottom of my slide. Um, and some of these institutes will run seminar, uh, seminars or webinars uh, specifically, I make a lot of uh, note, I, I frequent the San Diego Shoulder Institute seminar, which again, if I attended would cost me a couple thousand dollars in the past. But if you go a couple years after it's the, that seminar occurred, now you can view it on View Webby, uh, uh, View Medi and see the whole entire seminar. And I think it's a, a great benefit to have for practicing orthopedic surgeons. Now let's talk about the primary content, which again is surgical procedures. And I have to say myself and my colleagues, that's what we, I use it for primarily. So again, I just wanted to show you, if, if those of you who have not had access to ViewMedi, this would be the entry portal page. You have your view mail, your, if you, uh, your email, your password, you'll enter the site. And when, when you enter the site, this is what's very nice. At the top of the site, if I wanna look up something on a specific area, it's listed here in the header, different areas by uh, site, uh, an anatomical site, um, your favorites, you have a site for your favorites. And that's another great thing is that you view a, a video that you want to hold on to um, and you'll keep on your, your favorite site. For instance, uh, just to tell you an example, I have a, a, a reverse shoulder procedure I'm doing Wednesday. And I have, I always review the, this one favorite video I have on just for exposure, even though, look, I've done the exposure hundreds of times, but it's great to come back the night before surgery and just to review that. And I take the time, I go to my home office and I look at it and it's just been a very good security blanket for me. But the other thing to notice are, are the webinars that they have uh, on the site. Uh, and this is what a site will look like once you go down into, into uh, home down, you'll have the, if let's say you put in total hip procedures, You'll then have different subheadings where there'll be videos for acetabular cup placement, an anterior approach, um, and then it talks about different things. These might be a talk of a ceramic on ceramic bearings, and that would be possibly a seminar or webinar or even a, uh, a specific article. And so this typically is what the, uh, the, the, the picture will look like when you do look at a specific procedure. This will happen to, happen to be on direct end. And those will all be listed and tell you how long they are, who the author is. And then again, you can keep it as a favorite and come back to it later at your choosing. Um, here, I just wanted to show you that, again, they have a lot of these uh, past meetings. Here's the Metcalf Anna meeting um, on arthroscopic surgery in 2016. And again, they will list it by days and each talk on each day. So it's really a comprehensive way of reviewing a subject or a previous a meeting that you didn't have the opportunity to attend. As I mentioned, there are articles that are also listed on ViewMedi, and I find that it's also very beneficial to, to come and look at these articles. Uh, they list the journal, they list the article, and again, 
they may have a comment on these articles or discussion as you see here to the left. So once again, it's a nice way of getting some feedback rather than waiting for the next journal to come out and look at a specific uh, discusser or, or someone who may have had a comment on that specific article. Now, there are terms of use. You may, you know, they do the submissions. They do hold on to these submissions. Um, they can uh, control the display and or the adaptation to the site. And they're usually copied and they will back them up indefinitely. Um, there is some issue about access to be, if you want to terminate a specific video. And again, I didn't get in, delve into that with the, the people that run the site. Um, I'm sure, again, I would, I don't know if you could request, once your video has been posted, whether or not you could request it coming down. Um, but I think most people, when they do submit something, they assume that it's going to stay there indefinitely. Now let's talk briefly, fade into YouTube, because I know uh, Derek brought up educational things and how residents are using YouTube. They may be using it as well for procedures and uh, as far as educational, but I think where I see YouTube is used a lot, especially, obviously, how many patients come into your practice and say, well, I saw it on YouTube. Uh, do you do it this way? Uh, or sometimes even doctors, physicians may look at it at YouTube. I, I personally you will use ViewMedi over YouTube. And what, the reason is it's an open platform to everyone. And there really isn't uh, any clear peer interaction or review. And, and so anything be, can be posted. And again, I don't think that the platform is, is easily uh, is easy to use and utilize. And again, for maintaining favors, I guess you can, like you can maintain a video on YouTube, but I find it just not as user-friendly uh, as ViewMedi. Similarly, they retain content on their servers indefinitely. Um, and here's a perfect example. I mean, I'm sorry, some of my side things might have uh, the John Oliver show here and Saturday Night Live, which I tend to look at quite a bit also when I'm not studying for my WLA but uh, reviewing my articles. But anyway, again, these videos, they're very well done. Um, they're similar to what you see on ViewMedi, but again, I just find that it's not as uh, you know, user-friendly per se. Now, this was an interesting article that I found where the Journal of Arthroscopy did a study in 2015. I know it's old by six years, but they were actually looking to try to determine the quality of what was listed on YouTube. So they brought up, they searched specifically regarding ephemeral acetabular impingement. And they initially found there was a, a million two videos that came up, but they only really, for, for final analysis, they looked at a 52. And again, I don't know what the basis was for what determined what came down to 52 articles, but then they rated it on their system uh, and they came up with a rating or quality mean of three out of a maximum of six. And so the conclusion was overall, the material that was submitted to YouTube on this specific topic was of low quality. Again, this is just one area, but um, again, it just is a commentary on what's out there. Now let's go into Twitter. Now, again, I have to say I am not a Twitter or, or tweeter, um, but I know as Derek said, a lot of individuals are, are going to Twitter, but again, it's my understanding that the, that, that the platform with Twitter obviously is more limited to more feedback or, or characters. And it may refer you to an article or to a video, but you don't have the actual access to that video or uh, to the whole article necessarily on Twitter. Obviously it started in about 2006. It does require an account, but it's free. Uh, there are limited images that may be on a, a, twit, a tweet. Uh, interestingly, there were statistics in, that in 2018, there was about 2000 plus physicians in the United States using Twitter. I'm sure there's a lot more now. And each of them had an average of about 300 followers. So where I see that Twitter was used initially, especially for physicians, was a way to uh, communicate information to their patients in their practice. And I think it was uh, helpful for both, I think, to advertise your practice and keep people you know, uh, involved in your practice. But again, I don't think it was as much to communicate with physicians in the early stages. Now, I think you're seeing more and more online communities that are using Twitter for communication and access um, for publications and research. They can post an article initially before it's released and get some feedback and commentary. 
But I still think the primary use is still physician patient relations. And that's where there's a communication. Now, where is the greatest benefit I see for Twitter? Well, obviously I think the greatest benefit is during an emergency uh, service for communication during some sort of, uh, you know, like we had in the early stages of the pandemic or other some tragedy or emergency where it can be a great benefit where other sources of communication are down. But a great potential in our practice in orthopedics is a communicative and collaborative atmosphere for patients, but specifically between re uh, physicians and researchers where a researcher can post some information, um, post his article. And uh, if you're interested, you can then go to that article and quick and look at it and see what you think. Now, what is the greatest risk of Twitter? Well, this is, I think, one of the bigger problems is the inaccuracy of information. And there was a study done out of George Washington University where they looked uh, at a lot of medical uh, information that was passed on in Twitter and they found about a 20% of inaccuracy on that material that was posted. And again, the problem is because Twitter, a lot of information can be submitted by anyone. And there's no systemic process to check on the accuracy. And again, Twitter relies on crowdsourcing. Uh, one of the greatest risks, again, uh, this, uh, that you'll see in literature is when non-experts input information. And one of the biggest problems that happened with Twitter was when they were, uh, a lot of information was put out there about the vaccines and its effect on autism, especially with vaccines for children. This is before the COVID vaccine, but even now with COVID, there's a tremendous amount of information that is thrown out there on Twitter um, that is leading to decrease immunization in the United States. So that's a, a problem. Other thing is privacy. There were studies that looked at that and found that there was about a 5% of tweets were non-compliant when it came to HIPAA rules, as far as even coming from doctors. So uh, that is a problem because uh, doctors will tweet something that might have to deal with privacy of a patient's information. And so obviously there's a real compliance issue. Now, this is something that is may be more relevant again to residents, especially our tweet chats or journal clubs, where you can have real time events, journal clubs, like in the old days. I have to say, again, this is bringing back great memories. When I was in a residency, we had our journal club every two months and we would always meet at one of our attendings homes. It was a really nice thing. Um, but again, it was, it, was a, it was a whole night. You know, you had dinner, you reviewed the journal and everybody had to present. Nowadays, nobody has time for that. So these real-time events may be a very big benefit for our residents. Um, it, they're, they're also opening up sometimes these um, Twitter chats for a longer time frame to allow additional input for people who might not be present there at the time in, in live, I guess you call it live time when it's occurring at the exact time. So they have expanded the opening for that. Now, this is also another area where I see tweets can be very helpful. And in fact, for our COA meetings and for our academy meetings, and that's for where they would have Twitter's open, uh, a, a tweets open to the moderator, and he could utilize that to see questions posed by the audience without having someone necessarily come up to the microphones, which we're all used to at the academy meetings or our, even at our COA meeting. And this would be a way for someone who maybe just doesn't want to get up, but who could pose a question or pose a comment uh, during the meeting. And it, you know, it could be hectic at first, but it is a way to expand the discussion uh, at meetings, I think. One rule of thumb that's on Twitter, obviously, because everything's immediate and it gets out there right away is you don't lie or you try not to lie and then you don't pry, you don't cheat and you can't delete and you don't steal and you don't reveal. So again, that was just some uh, interesting thing I saw published there for Twitter, especially when it comes to dealing with medical um, information. Other sources um, that are available to us in practice for the practicing physician, who again is uh, out of training and not having to deal necessarily with ABOS one or two is the AOS has practice guidelines and orthopedic video theater. The JAOS also has that similar um, content. Uh, there is OrthoGate, maybe uh, Derek could comment on this because apparently I, I saw that OrthoGate is something available to residents or it's focused more on residency. Uh, hospital for sexual surgery has an on-demand 24 seven site. Even AO has a uh, 
24-7 site for getting information on procedures. And there's this other site, DocSpera, that's associated with the, uh, uh, the Hip and Knee Society that also is now opening up uh, for web-based information. So that kind of completes my talk. And now I guess uh, we can open things up um, to the members. Uh, um, you know, I have to say again, Derek, your presentation is, was very open. I mean, uh, just, I have to say why really brought in tremendous metrics to what's available to know for teaching our residents nowadays. Because again, I have to say, my knowledge base goes back to exactly what you said. We were studying for the OITE, you know, at that one period of time. And then when we were finishing residency, we were studying for the for, for board examination or at that point when we were ready to take it after two years, or, or excuse me, at the end of our residency. Um, so again, do you, do you see that the information that you're bringing forth is getting to the residencies? I mean, is it getting out there to the AOS or to the, uh, David, is it getting to the, 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 the area that you were involved in for so many years as, you know, with the residency review committees? What you mean, do people use ortho bullets or? Not just ortho bullets, but the whole, all, what you were discussing as far as the metrics in evaluating um, how residents are learning and this whole concept of trying to focus training to each specific resident rather than to just hurt looking at them like a herd. Oh yeah. I mean, we had, this stuff is very real. So algorithmic learning, like we have, we have an algorithm Ankenius. We have one resident, his OIT scores went from less than 30% to above 70%. And that's uh, in 12 months. And so algorithmic learning is powerful, you know, I mean, and this is how residents like to learn. There was a, you know, published in the Green Journal from the Academy. There was a, a national survey of what residents use, and this is what they use. This is how they want to study. And, uh, you know, and what we see in orthopedics is just the tip of the iceberg to these trends that we're seeing in medical students. And I tell people that, you know, you know, <laughs> Jeff, David, we're not going to go out, pick up a football and play football against a bunch of 16 year olds. We know it's going to happen. Education is a technology business now. It is moving that fast. I mean, one major educational company just raised 60 million in venture capital. Their algorithms, machine learning, AI, these are groundbreaking things. And you know, I, I think the question is, what are the roles of the Academy and all these other, and you just, you know, when you go in and it sounds like you do shoulders, when you're doing that reverse shoulder arthroplasty, you're not taking out the machine shop on the back and making a reverse shoulder. It's like you embrace your rep, you embrace that technology, and that helps you drive value. Your art is putting the thing in. So, you know, I just think we as educators, we need to think of these new technologies as tools that we can use to work our craft, just like you have scalpels and implants on the back table. So yeah, this, this technology is there. It is being used. Have you ever heard of Anki, Jeff? No. So, so you know, every medical student knows the term Anki like you use, know the word JBGS. It's that's transformational. And Anki is just a flashcard. Anki is disrupting everything in the world of education. So this stuff is here, it is fast. And my biggest concern is that it's creating this cultural gap between the young learners and the educators. And we work, you know, we have Worthable, it says, you know, if 180, we work with 180 of the residency programs. We work in five different countries. I spend my days doing webinars with faculty residents thinking about, okay, how can we improve conference? Like what's going on in conference? We talk about things like, why is there this growing gap between how residents click with the faculty? We hear about stuff like faculty saying, you know, one chairman said to me, he's like, I went to give a talk to the lectures. I tortured my night the before. I made a PowerPoint presentation, went in there. You know, a lot of the residents weren't there, never doing again. 
you talk to the residents, they're like, this guy showed up. He obviously made the PowerPoint the night before. It's obviously the same slides from five years ago. And it was a horrible presentation. And then you have this. So, so we're really into, you know, how we can bring technology into residency education just to get, you know, everybody having fun again, you know. David, do you think do you think it's it's transitioning or demonstrating in your assessment of even the more, the younger orthopedists that are coming out that you're seeing benefit of this transformation? Well, I think we we don't want to lose sight of the the whole picture. So we've looked at um, residency education. And um, we have uh, looked at that in, in three areas and we call our knowledge, skills and behavior program. So certainly when someone finishes, we want them to have the requisite knowledge. And we've worked to try and worked with the academy to link the OITE exam to the part one exam so that the OITE scores are actually meaningful uh, or more meaningful than they've been, uh, um, I should say. And so that they can, the, and that exam is greatly improved. We've matched the blueprints uh, of both of our examinations, which has improved both of the exams uh, and the value. And then when you look at surgical skills, I mean, we, we have not evaluated residents on surgical skills other than, you know, you get to the end of your rotation. They said, oh, uh, Jeff, you did a pretty good job on that rotation. Or you know, what we got was, you know, just keep your head down and your feet moving and you move on to the next rotation. And I think looking at surgical skills and how that's acquired, I think that's important. We need tools to evaluate that. So that's what we've looked for there. And then finally, the whole behavior uh, issue, you know, behavior professionalism. I, I always tell residents when I'm talking to them that if you're going to lose your certification, you know, we can educate people. It's just like Derek said, you know, we can educate them in the knowledge and we can teach people to be surgeons. If you're going to lose your certification far and away, the reason that people lose their board certification is on the behavior professionalism side. So we need to identify that early as well and have tools to measure that and let residency program directors know this person's lagging behind in knowledge or in surgical skills or in their behavior and allow them to look at that as opposed to the whole, you know, just sort of swish around a tea bag for five years in a residency milieu. And at the end, you get an orthopedic surgeon. We need to measure their competency in those areas along the way. So that, those are the kind of tools that we're looking at at the board. I think it, it's, it's uh, critical. And, and Jeff, I want to emphasize that, you know, one, one thing I want to bring up is that you know, when you think of, you know, I agree with David, there's the three components, medical knowledge, patient care, professionalism per the ACGM. You know, the, the reason people get run out of town is professionalism issues. Yet we don't have a big curriculum around professionalism. You know, the, you know, one thing we've really, I mean, you look at a surgeon coming out of training 50 years ago, most people would say they were better surgeons than our trainings now. We're all zapping. So patient care skills, there's these you know, we lost some ground and that was due to reasons that we've all understand and it's been published. In terms of the medical knowledge, I think, you know, the, the beauty of orthobullets and the beauty of these space repetition algorithms is it takes that stupid distraction off the plate of the faculty. We don't need to have a faculty wasting his time teaching the classification system. You know, the, the most challenging thing a resident needs to learn is knowing whether he should do a total hip or a hemiarthroplasty. There's all these gray zone decisions. And that's when I speak to fellowship directors, they talk about the gray zones, the nuance of medicine, the art of medical decisions. So, you know, we, you know, taking a test, the OIT, ABOS part one, yes, those are important things. Those are prerequisites. You need to have that knowledge foundation. You need to, the next stage, apply that knowledge on exam to choose one through five answers. But the holy grail in medical education where I'm hoping we're going to get is that complex decision making where there is no correct answer. And all the time we face a decision where it could be 50-50. And I tell residents, whenever you come to a 50-50 decision, well, first of all, identify the decisions that are easy. Okay, femoral neck fracture gets surgery. That's easy. Don't even waste your time thinking about that. But then those harder decisions, if it's a 50-50, 
try to throw it into three buckets. One, it's a controversy. You know, some evidence shows some stuff, some shows the other. The other is it's a coin flip, like ACDF. I mean, cervical myelopathy, whether I go in from the front or the back, that's a coin flip, dealer's choice. And then there's these other ones, what we call tweeners, where, oh, there's like two millimeters of articular incongruity. Maybe we should do surgery or not. Let's face it, this is what we spend our time doing as doctors. We worry about this stuff. It keeps us up at night. Whether we're doing the right thing, we all want to do the right thing for patients. And doing the right thing is about those decisions, those gray zone decisions that aren't being answered in the literature, aren't being assessed. Yet, who can do that well? The faculty, they're the only ones. Orthobolus can't do it. They do it in the, and they do it well. But somehow, we got the faculty all wrapped up in doing PowerPoint presentations on classification systems. You know, what's the get the best conference that everyone loves? Fracture conference, you know? So, so anyway, the point being is that we just, in my opinion, we just kind of got distracted from the essence of what being a doctor is. And we just had to get back to that, you know, and faculty, they just don't have time. They don't get paid for teaching. So it's just, you know, we just got to recognize that they have very little time and focus faculty on doing those critical things that residents can't learn on Viewmedi or Orthobolus, which is how to think. And as David said, professionalism. Oh my God, you know, we have so much work to do there. But uh, I just want to throw in again my two bits for uh, WLA, David. I just have to say, you know, having now on my fourth recertification, I've got to tell you the WLA has just been just the greatest, I think, uh, thing for me as a practicing surgeon. Even the changes you made from year last year to this year, or the, uh, excuse me, from the first year to the second year, made it a better exam. Um, and also, just the, the fact you bring out, it is an educational process to now be able to pick articles that are important to my practice. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times when I was studying for the old recertification exam that I had to go through all of the pediatric stuff that was still on the original exam because I take the general orthopedic exam. I don't take the specialty exams and I'd have to go through that all the time at, at nauseum and I just, all of it. So now I can focus on the things that are relevant to my practice. And I really think it's been a great benefit for the practicing orthopedic surgeons. And again, all orthopedic surgeons, but especially the ones that have been around for a while. Now we can focus on what's good, important to us. No, absolutely. I agree. I, I think it's, uh, it's gratifying to see people, uh, looking at looking at the literature the way they are, I you know people call me and say, why would you have included this article? This is a terrible article. I don't like this about it, and this is a better article, and you should consider this. And I said, you know, I think actually I win this game because you read two articles. I only wanted you to read the one, and, and so I think you know, and, and it's it spawned some journal clubs and things like that. So I, I think it it uh, it helps people look at the places they want to learn. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Derek, what we need to do now is try and apply those things across a career. I mean, and how we do that, that's, um, it, you know, that's a, an interesting, um, next step as well, because we'll start to get, as you talked about big data about how people learn and it's going to be different for some people. So we're going to have to adapt to that, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, interesting to, to hear some of those uh, applications of the technology. And I think we'll have to follow that very closely. Yeah, and I, I agree with Jeff. I commend what ABS did with WLA. You know, I think the, the first year you guys did it, when I had to learn all 15 articles and then take them all, that was, that was I'm just going to say it, it was worse than anything I'd done. I literally <laughs> had 15 articles. I memorized them all. Right. Because the, David, the thing you guys had to get to is its value. We, we talk about value all the time. Value is quality over cost. And when we talk about WLA, we got to talk about knowledge retention. I learned, I mean, Jeff, if I asked you about your WLA articles right now, I do this all the time. You'd be shocked how much you forget in six months from those articles. And I, I'm not downplaying WLA because it's such a, a great monumental step in the right direction. But once we get it really good, David, once you guys get it really good, people are gonna be reading those articles as they see that patient. You're gonna see a patient come in on that reverse. You're gonna read an article about that reverse. 
And it's not going to happen at this arbitrary point in time because your retention goes down tenfold. And David, that first year I did it, I literally memorized 15 articles, totally stressed me out, did it all the night before. Every surgeon I spoke to read all their <laughs> articles two days before. Do you know what that means? They forget it two days later. Now, the second time you did it where you could tackle one at a time over a prolonged period of time was like, oh, that was wonderful. You know, that was a wonderful thing. But um, so anyhow, you know, it's all exciting. There's lots of change and, and that's what's important. Well, um, again, I want to, I, I can't think of any other things. I, I, I appreciate both of you being available and uh, being a part of this symposium. Like I said, I'm always concerned about trying to update orthopedic knowledge for the practice in orthopedic surgeon, especially the ones that uh, are putting on a few years here. And again, I appreciate both your input and I do appreciate uh, the uh, COA putting on this sem symposium. And again, I uh, want to thank Oren Franco for uh, putting together the meeting this year. Again, we are under, are under the constraints of COVID, but uh, hopefully uh, people will take something away from our symposium. And again, I want to thank Diane for all the help she has been to all of us for putting together this symposium and everything she does for COA. So again, thank you all for being a part of this and uh, looking forward to an in-person meeting next year. Thank you, Jeff. Absolutely. Thank you, David. Thank you, Diane. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care, everyone.